uh, we shall uh, now go to the next session, which is uh, cardiac hot topics, uh, session number 14. Uh, first uh, lecture will be uh, uh, provided by uh, uh, Professor Rodrigo uh, Salgado. Uh, the vulnerable plaque in 2022, w what's new? Dr. Uh, Rodrigo is a radiologist at the Holy Heart Hospital Lair and the Antrop uh, University Hospital. His main field of interest is the non-invasive CT MR uh, imaging uh, of cardiovascular uh, disease. Since 2017, he is a member of the Exec Executive Committee of the European Society of Cardiovascular Radiology, uh, where he is now the Vice President. Uh, he serves in the Scientific Editorial Board of Insights, uh, Insights into Imaging. Uh, and sits in the editorial board of the International uh, Journal of Cardiovascular uh, Imaging. Uh, I think uh, Insights is uh, the main editor uh, is uh, Dr. Uh, Marty Bonmarty. Yes, He's that's my correct. best friend. That's correct. <laughs> we always exchange visits. Uh, he's uh, an excellent uh, research guy. Um, and we work f in, in many projects here in uh, conjunction with uh, his group. Uh, he serves in the Scientific uh, Editorial Board of Insights, as we mentioned, also in the International Journal of Cardiovascular Imaging. He is currently also section editor of the Cardiovascular Division of ESR uh, Euro Red. Currently, he is a faculty member of the European Congress of Radiology program team for the editions of 2021 2023 and 2024. Finally, he is a member of the uh, core committee which uh, oversees the a ADIR uh, diploma of the European Board of Radiology. You just go ahead. Please. So, uh, good evening everyone. Thank you for the introduction. I could hardly recognize myself. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation. First time in Egypt, but uh, from what I've seen here, probably not the last time. I promised I will come back. So, um, I will talk to you about the vulnerable plaque, new insights in 2023. And of course, the vulnerable plaque, that's a plaque that is at high risk for rupture and we think causes myocardial infarction now and then. So, I would like to start by giving you some new insights regarding atherosclerosis. What have we learned in the last decade? Well, first, all our efforts to lower the risk of cardiac disease have given some um, advantages, as we have now this lipid-lowering medication, and we are also very effective, or more effective than we used to, in treating arterial hypertension. And at least in the Western world, people are smoking less and less. However, we see that we still have an obesity epidemic and that as people are growing older and older, of course, cardiac and cardiovascular diseases are increasing in numbers. And also, we think that we have reached the limits of what we can do regarding cardiac prevention of ischemic heart disease. When looking, however, outside the Western world, we see that in developing countries that there is a greater impact of atherosclerosis. We still have the obesity impact but we also see that when countries are becoming more prosperous, that the diet is becoming to change and that people are eating less healthy and developing more atherosclerotic disease, for example, in China. We see also more and more metabolic syndrome. And we have also learned that these high density lipoproteins maybe are not as protective as we used to think. And there is an increasing um, importance of triglycerides. I will come back to this later. And of course, finally, the genetic factor in determining who is going to develop atherosclerotic disease and who is not is also becoming more and more recognized. And I think that you have seen already uh, figures like this, where we start with a completely normal vessel on the left, go to a completely occluded vessel on the right, and we think that is a continuous process that cannot be stopped. However, recent insights have learned that atherosclerosis is not a continuous process, but it's a dynamic process, and it can regress when you act in time. So it does not have to be always progressive. 
And we have also learned that there is a lot of components determining who determines who gets atherosclerosis and who doesn't. These are, for example, metabolic factors, but inflammation is becoming a more and more important topic in regarding the study of atherosclerosis. So inflammation drives atherosclerosis in a dynamic, non-continuous way. What does it mean when we look at the vulnerable plaque? Because we have learned from histology studies more than 10 years ago that the vulnerable plaque, this so-called high-risk plaque, has different tissue components. We have this fibrous tissue, we have a lipid component, we have a fibrous cap, and we have some calcifications. And as these components progress, we get this typical vulnerable or high-risk plaque with a large lipid-rich necrotic core. You can also have intra-plaque hemorrhage besides the lipid-rich necrotic core. We have these fissures in the thin fibrous cap which can be a rupture then release the thrombogenic content in the artery and cause myocardial infarction, all driven with inflammation and macrophage activity. So this is the sequence that we all know. Uh, plaque starts with all these different components, become a high-risk plaque, can rupture at a given moment and develop myocardial infarction. This is what we know, this is what we think always happens. However, is it always fatal? When we have plaque rupture, do you always get myocardial infarction? Well, in fact, when we look at pathology studies of people who have died from non-cardiac causes, so people who have died without a myocardial infarction, and we look at the coronary arteries, we see, in fact, that up to one-third of those people have signs of ruptured plaque, meaning that not every plaque that ruptures causes symptoms. So a vulnerable plaque does not mean that you are always getting a myocardial infarction when it ruptures. We have also learned that besides this typical morphology of a high-risk plaque, there is also a different process, plaque erosion, where we have driven by inflammation this neutrophil activity where you get clot formation at the uh, surface of the plaque. It's not coming from within the plaque, you have at the surface of the plaque, plaque erosion and then thrombus formation. So this superficial erosion is an increasing recognized cause of arterial thrombosis. So when we compare the typical vulnerable plaque with plaque erosion, we see some striking differences. First, with plaque erosion, you have no fibrous cap. This is the lipid poor plaque with abundant inflammation, with a platelet rich thrombus and also a female predominance. So these are clear difference between a classic plaque rupture from the high risk plaque and this plaque erosion. And it becomes even more important when we're looking at what causes eventually a myocardial infarction. It, it has been shown that up to 40% of acute thrombotic occlusions do not come from the classic plaque rupture that we have seen, but have erosion as a substrate. And it becomes even more complex when we think that these are not mutually exclusive pathologies, that you have can both classic plaque rupture, plaque erosion, and that you have a sequence of rupture, healing, rupture of healing that leads to plaque growth and eventually becomes a subocclusive stenosis. So all these different pathologies are not mutually exclusive, which means that I cannot blame you if at a given moment you say, well, now I'm confused. What is more important? Is it a high risk feature? Is it inflammation? Is it metabolic syndrome? In fact, it's all of this. When we have the high risk features, when we have driven by inflammation and we have diffuse atherosclerosis, this the, co the conglomerate of all these components that defines your global atherosclerotic risk. So this is what we should go for in the future to personalized advice regarding the global atherosclerotic burden, not just looking at one single plaque. So can we detect these high-risk plaques with CT? Yes, of course, we know. These are the different components that are known. And with CT, we have the advantage that we can look also at the vessel wall. We can look at calcification. We can look at positive remodeling. And as such, try to determine all these different plaque uh, features that are typically known for these high-risk vulnerable plaques. So we can identify them with CT. Now, why is it so important that we also mention this in the report? So not looking all, always for obstructive disease, 
but also looking for plaque morphology. Because when we see a plaque like this, this is the so-called napkin ring sign, we know from histology studies that this kind of plaque has a higher risk of rupture in the future. So what means that we are looking, for example, at patients with stable chest disease, and you see this kind of plaque, it should be reported because it means that in the future, this patient, even when he has non-obstructed disease, is at higher risk of developing myocardial infarction. And it has been shown when you have obstructive disease and you have at least one high-risk plaque, only one, your risk for myocardial infarction increases with a factor of 10. That's, that's quite a lot. And also, even when you have non-calcified components, only non-calcified plaques, the more non-calcified plaques or the higher your low attenuation plaque burden, that is your strongest predictor for future fatal and non-fatal myocardial infarction. So, how it should we report this? Because when you look, for example, at the cat rat score, the cat rat score is based on the highest degree of stenosis that you detect in the coronary arteries. You have these modifiers for high-risk plaque morphology, but it basically is, it is basically, um, uh, the fundamental is the highest degree of stenosis in the coronary arteries. So what does it mean? Because we are looking at high-risk plaque, not stenosis. When you have a cat rat score of zero, you have a very, very low risk of having myocardial infarction, but it is not zero. And this risk becomes higher for um, a higher cat rat score. However, it does not increase. And what is the relation between the degree of stenosis and the possible vulnerable plaque, as we are talking about, is that the more atherosclerosis that you have, the higher the likelihood that you have a higher degree of stenosis, but also the higher the likelihood that you will have a high risk plaque. So your high degree of lumen stenosis becomes like a proxy for the probability of having a high risk vulnerable plaque. So that's indeed a correlation that has been found between the cat rat score and the presence of a vulnerable plaque. Very important question I get asked from time to time, must you treat a specific vulnerable plaque? When we see a vulnerable plaque, must be treated? The answer is no. So the presence of vulnerable plaque is indeed a risk factor for the future. But at this moment, we are not able to tell which plaque is active or not, which plaque is going to rupture in the future or not. So while we should report it, and indeed clinicians should take care of it, we are at this moment, we don't have enough evidence to treat, for example, with the stent, an individual high-risk plaque that we see. And this is very important when discussing these findings with our clinicians. But what it does mean is when you report this, and the clinician understands what you are saying, that the presence of this high-risk plaque can modify medication, can modify preventive treatment, and this is going to help. So this is eventually what we do as radiologists. We are guiding our clinicians regarding not only stenosis severity, but also regarding plaque composition, so we can point out to future risk, so we can modify the treatment of the patient and that, and only that, will result in a better clinical outcome. And this is the main message of my lecture of today. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rodrigo. If uh, there is any question to Dr. Rodrigo regarding this uh, lecture, uh, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Mulig. This is a great lecture. Thank you so much. Um, regarding the black burden thing that you mentioned in the lecture, um, well, I, I know that in the cat rats there is no mentioning of the black burden, but there is an updated version, the cat rats 2. Yes. Yes, and they mentioned the, 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 the black burden, they even gave it the, the P score from um, P1 to uh, to be for do, do you think this addresses the issue that we're talking about? Yes, I think that um, it doesn't really have to matter whether you use cat rats or cat rats too or whatever, um, because not everyone uses cat rats. Uh, cat rats has its proponents and not proponents. I think what is most important is that you and your cardiologist know what you are meaning and how you are communicating with each other. 
For example, um, when you have um, non-obstructive disease, as most patients with cardiac CT know, but you see high risk plaques, I communicate to the cardiologist and I've spoken with him and he knows or she knows what I mean with that. I think that a correct communication is more important than a cataract classification because a cataract classification is very useful when making classifications, of course, but it doesn't treat, uh, give you the impression of the, the risk for that individual patient. You can have, for example, a patient with one high risk plaque and 10 high risk plaques and still it's the same cataract classification. But you can guess that the risk for those two patients will be different. So I think how you formulate um, in your report is even more important than a specific cataract score, even if it's version two. Do you find any difficulty with the cardiologists understanding your report? For example, like when you say, this is a plaque with napkin ring sign. Do all well, of them do you understand this? I mentioned, for example, napkin ring sign in my description, but in my conclusion, I say plaque with high risk characteristics. Right. So nobody cares, uh, nobody knows the napkin sign, but when I say in my conclusion that this plaque has high risk characteristics, everyone understands that. So I try to use the language that everyone understands and that is very clear also for in the future for other people who are reading the reports. Thank you, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rodrigo. I want to ask uh, small questions. Uh, this is about vulnerable plaque in uh, 222. In the future, in the few uh, coming years, like uh, two, uh, 2030, is there is any role for the artificial intelligence in detection and the characterization of the black so we can know yes. easily way to, to, to know uh, the nature? Actually, um, for example, for the napkin ring sign, um, the group of uh, Palmarovic Horvat, who uh, is very well known for this sign, has developed AI software which increases the detection of napkin ring sign. So, we know of their stated that many people miss the napkin, napkin ring sign because they don't know it, so it's underreported. So I think that AI can help us in detect those kind of plaques, but what still is missing, and I think this is the problem for all AI-driven parameters, for example, like perivascular inflammation, we can detect it, we can see it, but to make the transition from what we see to a clinical decision, that's something completely different. So, for example, if we have AI and it detects more and more high-risk plaques, we need also a guideline to transfer that information to a treatment of the patient. As long as we don't have that guideline, we can collect information, but nobody knows what to do with it. So maybe in the future, as we get to get more and more data, we can also get to more guidelines how to use that data in clinical practice. I think that's the main challenge for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez.